Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to our Ask the Doctor session tonight on the topic of palliative care for Parkinson's disease. My name is Shelley Curian with SkyPass Foundation and I'm excited to introduce you guys to our featured speaker for tonight, Dr. Jory Fleischer. Dr. Fleischer is the Leslie Nanberge Endowed Faculty Scholar in Parkinson's Disease Research and an Associate Professor of Neurological Sciences at Rush University Medical Center. She directs the Rush Lewy Body Dementia Association Research Center of Excellence, the Cure PSP Center of Care, and the Advanced Movement Disorder Supportive Care Clinic. Dr. Fleischer has applied her training in movement disorders and palliative care to her funded studies of home visits, caregiver support, and peer mentoring to understand, improve, and advocate for the lives of those living with advanced movement disorders. Dr. Fleischer, thank you so much for being here. We are honored to have you here and excited to hear from you on this topic. Also joining us tonight is Dr. Shilpa Chitnis, no stranger to us. Dr. Chitnis sits on our board of directors here at SkyPass Foundation, and she is a professor of neurology and movement disorder specialist at UT Southwestern, and she will be moderating tonight's discussion. If you guys have any questions, please feel free to keep those coming throughout the conversation, utilizing the chat box or the QA box on the bottom of your screen. We also received some questions from you guys with your registration, so we'll be sure to address those as well tonight. And with that, Dr. Chitnis, I will hand it over to you. I want to spend the first couple of minutes really talking about uh, the current state of healthcare for seriously ill patients. And perhaps we can talk briefly about you know, what specific uh, things that are part of advanced Parkinson's disease that require a lot of care uh, and of concern. And then we'll spend really a large part of the time talking about palliative care, which is very important for our patients. So thank you for being here. So I'm gonna ask you, um, what do you perceive as the current state of healthcare for seriously ill patients with, and then seriously ill patients also with PD? Thank you so much. And thank you, Dr. Chitnas and Shelley for inviting me. It is an honor to speak with all of you and especially to give up your time um, in the evening. So I think it's a great question. And if we sort of look at the broad scope of healthcare, even before COVID, but I think COVID has amplified a lot of these issues, um, you know, for individuals who are dealing with chronic progressive diseases, chronic disabling diseases, you know, the state of healthcare is really fractured. It's very broken. Um, and you, you know, if you are living with Parkinson's, you may feel this is that, you know, if you've ever had that feeling of why can't this doctor talk to this other doctor or why does this form have to go through this form? There's just a lot of disjointed care and people who have a chronic condition, you know, so many times it's not just one symptom and we'll get into that. But there's so many different symptoms and no one, no one follows the textbook. So everyone is a little bit different. And so trying to navigate the healthcare system, which really tries to put people into, here is a box, you have these symptoms, you see this person, this is what we do. But Parkinson's didn't read that textbook. So Parkinson says, you can have any of the following things from all of these different columns. And you could have some column A, you can have some column Q, right? And it takes time and it takes listening and it takes communication for patients and care partners and for physicians and healthcare providers to hear all the different symptoms and pieces and say, here's who should be taking care of these. Here's who we need to bring into the team. And here's how to get that care streamlined. You know, and instead, so much of our healthcare for Parkinson's and for many other conditions winds up being a lot of a runaround, a lot of difficulty, and a lot of patients and care partners feeling like they don't know who to go to. They don't know, they don't feel like the communication is clear. Um, and so there's just so much frustration. Um, and especially as we get towards more advanced um, Parkinson's disease and related disorders, it becomes really, really difficult. Um, and I think Dr. Chitness, you'd, you'd mentioned, you know, what about advanced Parkinson's disease? And I, you know, I have this talk a lot with our residents and our fellows training people to take care of people with advanced Parkinson's. And they say, what exactly is the definition of advanced Parkinson's? And patients who ask, you know, where am I on the spectrum? Um, so I just wanted to speak to that really quickly because we have, for better or worse, we have a five point staging system, right? And I just told you everyone with Parkinson's is so different. And yet we're somehow supposed to bin everyone or categorize them into you're in this stage, uh, you know, one through five. And so 
for reference, stage one is often so early that people haven't even come to care yet. They may have symptoms that are so subtle that they think, no, maybe this is normal aging. You know, maybe this is nothing. I'm just going to ignore it. And so stage one is symptoms that are really mild just on one side of the body. Stage two is symptoms that can still be quite mild, but both sides of the body are affected, maybe asymmetrically, one side more than the other, but both sides are affected, but no change with walking, no change with balance, not falling. And stage three, so right in the middle on a five-point scale, stage three means symptoms are more moderate and balance is starting to be affected. Posture is starting to be affected. So maybe we're starting to see some of this. Maybe we're starting to see a little bit of shuffling with walking but still walking independently. No cane, no walker, nothing else is needed. Stage four means someone needs an assistive device, a cane, a walker to help them with their mobility, to help them get around. And stage five is wheelchair or bed bound, um, you know, the majority of the time. And most people with Parkinson's disease, we don't believe, spend much time or ever get to stage four, stage five, because something else crops up in their healthcare first, right? Their diabetes, their high blood pressure, their cardiac disease, something else. So most people with Parkinson's die with Parkinson's, not from Parkinson's. But in many, many papers that talk about advanced Parkinson's disease, when we look at the characteristics and who they're talking about, they say stage three. And so I just told you it's a five point scale and stage three is in the middle but we're often forgetting to talk about stage four and stage five. And so when I, when I say advanced, I mean more folks stage four and stage five. Yes, uh, thank you so much uh, for explaining that. And you know, as, as all of us know that the early Parkinson's uh, symptoms are pretty well managed, but you know, let's talk just a little bit about, um, uh, could you just name for us like the non-motor symptoms that are of most concern for you? Absolutely. Um, I think there are several. So I think apathy is something that we overlook frequently and that often people living with the disease don't complain about, but care partners and family complain about. And apathy is different from depression. Apathy is that loss of motivation, the loss of oomph, the loss of drive to do things. And that could be doing the things you love. That could be doing the physical therapy that is you know, critical, doing the exercise. That could be eating just losing the, the motivation to do that. And it leads to a lot of frustration um, on the part of care partners and the part of family who they feel like they're pushing their loved one to do the things that they need to do. And they often feel like their loved one is resisting them. And the person with Parkinson's who has apathy may feel like, I just don't want it today. Just leave me alone and I'll do all that stuff tomorrow. So I think that's an under-recognized issue. I think as people get older and as Parkinson's goes on for longer, we can encounter both cognitive change, so cognitive impairment, dementia. We can encounter hallucinations and delusions, which can become really challenging to deal with, especially to, to deal with in the home without a lot of support. Um, and I think also the urinary dysfunction is a very big problem because people wind up having frequent urinary tract infections in some cases, and it leads to this revolving door of the hospital and rehospitalizations and nursing home potentially. So I think those are very big issues, um, not for everyone, but some of those for many people. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and also, what can you tell us about motor fluctuations in patients with advanced PD and how do they impact quality of life? I think they're huge. And I think um, early on in the disease, we have a lot of tools in our arsenal and we can, you know, sort of paint with all the different colors on the Parkinson's palette, right? As people age and as Parkinson's gets more advanced, the side effects of a lot of the other medications start to really outweigh the benefits. And so we tend to kind of peel back some of the other medications and we're, we're left with our oldie but goodie, which is carbidopa levodopa. And you know, levodopa is giving back your brain what you're missing. The challenge is it's not giving it back to your brain in the way that your brain wants it. So we can't give it at a really nice stable dose all the time. You have to have it in these, you know, bits and pieces and fluctuations. And so people can become sensitive and more sensitive to those fluctuations. And sometimes there's wearing off that's not just the motor and feeling stiff and slow and freezing, 
right? So when you get up and try to get up out of a chair, go to the bathroom, getting stuck, um, but can also be anxiety, um, can be a lot of issues as people come off. Dr. Fleischer, if you don't mind, what I'm going to do, uh, thank you again. I'm going to show this, uh, I want to show this picture because, you know, I think this graph is so very well. If you could just explain to our audience what this graph means. I'm just going to share this. Um, uh, Absolutely. Um, I'm glad you shared it because my gesturing is probably wild and not going to be seen. Um, so, you know, earlier on in Parkinson's, it's almost like if you if you picture sort of the base of um, the squiggle, right? So the valley here is when people are taking their levodopa and it slowly creeps up in your system. The blood level is going to creep up in your system and then it slowly goes down. And here's the thing is that curve looked the same the first day you took levodopa and it's going to look the same 20 years into le taking levodopa. It always does the same thing in your bloodstream. What those, so the, the top sort of light blue area and the bottom light blue area, those change, those sort of evolve over time and grow because of the brain sensitivity to both losing its own dopamine and having it replaced sort of in this pulsatile kind of intermittent fashion where you're getting it every once in a while through the meds. And so it's almost like those thresholds creep in over time. And so you have to kind of get past that first line so it might take a little bit longer for the meds to kick in over time. So where it used to maybe take 15 or 20 minutes, maybe now it takes 45 minutes to really feel like your levodopa is working. And then you have that time in the middle, sort of the deeper blue time, where you feel good. You're moving the way you want to move, but you overshoot the target. Um, and so there's that, that on with dyskinesia time, which is, you know, you've got sort of extra movements. And what that is, people think about it as a side effect of the medication and kind of blame the medication. And it's, it's a combination of the disease and the medication. So if you had Parkinson's for 30 years, but you never went on levodopa, you wouldn't get dyskinesias. What you would do is you'd be in that off zone all the time, right? And you wouldn't have good movement the way you want to. So the, those peaks are basically the, the dopamine receptor cells that need to see levodopa getting a little bit overstimulated and overexcited and overproducing movement. And so we, we find sort of that therapeutic window narrows and you have sort of more time where you're too low and then you get a little bit of good time, sort of the Goldilocks zone, and then you get that time where it's too much and the extra movement. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let me ask you just, uh, you know, like a, 30 second to a minute um, observation on falls in patients with Parkinson's disease. So uh, there's so many reasons. I think, you know, when, when I try and talk with people about falls, I want to know when are they happening? When during the day? When during the span of their medications? Is, is it happening when the meds are wearing off and a person feels stiff and stuck and slow and frozen? their feet feel frozen to the ground, well, then we need to kind of adjust the timing of the meds to, to make that better. Are they falling in the middle of the night as they walk to the bathroom? Um, and can we get them waking up less often to pee, um, in which case we can sort of prevent the falls? Are they walking to the bathroom in the dark? And sometimes a nightlight, you know, fixes that or having a bedside commode. So it's really a question of what is leading to falls? Absolutely. Um, and generally, what stage do you start to see falls in? We can start to see falls in stage three. Um, I tend to think more about stage four as having more falls or, um, you know, the, the gross thing is that we say stage four, someone is using an assistive device. But certainly there are a lot of people who aren't using the assistive device but might be falling less if they were. Um, so stage three, you know, it's not uncommon to have people falling. Absolutely. And uh, where does one go to look for resources? You know, you had a couple of things, you know, what kind of dressing or what kind of shoes to wear, right? And then how to transfer. So um, what kind of razors, like what kind of toothbrushes? What, what can you say about? So um, I, I am a wholehearted believer in occupational therapy. They are the troubleshooters. They are 
the people that you go to and you say, I am having a hard time putting my shoes on, getting my socks on, you know, dealing with teeny tiny buttons. Um, and they often have incredible tips and tricks and strategies and products and assistive devices that, you know, as physicians, we very rarely get trained on. And the ones that I know about, I know about from my patients telling me, um, and I know about from my OT colleagues telling me, but there are, you know, if it's hard to, to button your button down shirt, but you still want to wear a button down shirt, there are companies that will make button down shirts that the buttons are there, but it actually closes by small magnets that people can't see. So it looks like every other shirt, but it's so much easier to put on. Um, you know, simple things like that. Shoes that the, the back kind of pops up around your heel. So you can just stand up, put your foot in and you don't have to tie it. You don't have to bend down. Um, a lot of the simple things that can take people with Parkinson's a long time and you'd much rather be spending your time doing something else. So like make the shoe work better for you, um, you know, than spending time bending down and tying and retying. Yes, definitely. Um, some of the problems that, you know, we're really worried about are uh, drooling and trouble swallowing. And, you know, patients don't always listen when you say the speech volume is slow, uh, you know, you, you need to get evaluated for speech therapy. What can you tell patients about uh, you know, swallowing difficulty and about drooling and, and the risks? So I think, you know, sometimes, sometimes we start with sort of the, you know, the sweetness, which is that there are a lot of things that you can do about this. And sometimes that is motivation enough. Um, I try not to, you know, the carrot versus the stick. Um, the stick is that if people are having trouble swallowing, and sometimes that means I feel something getting stuck in my throat, I feel myself coughing on a, you know, piece of dry bread or a tough piece of meat, Sometimes it's subtle and it may just be that pill that feels like it's sticking more than it used to or feeling like you have to double swallow, um, you know, a sip of water. Be mindful of those subtle things because we would always rather catch something early before it's a big problem. If people are having trouble swallowing in Parkinson's, they are at a higher risk of aspiration and silent aspiration, which means coughing things down the wrong pipe. And sometimes everyone can do this. You feel it go down the wrong pipe. Sometimes you don't. So silent aspiration means something is sneaking down into your lungs and if fluid or particles of food are sitting there, they can be very irritating and cause a pneumonia. And that's what we want to think about ahead of time and prevent because that can be incredibly serious. So drooling sometimes you know, is excessive and that can get swallowed down the wrong pipe. Um, so there are a lot of easy things to do for drooling. Um, it's as simple as finding your favorite sour candy and if you have a sour candy in your mouth, even though it actually makes you make more saliva, it's reminding your brain to swallow more often. And that's the issue in Parkinson's. Isn't that you're necessarily making more saliva, but it's kind of pooling up in your mouth more. So you have to cue yourself to swallow it. If you feel like your tongue movements are not what they used to be, if you have a hard time manipulating food in your mouth, don't pile a sour candy onto the problem. Lollipops, as long as, you know, it's not someplace where someone's going to give you a hard time for having a lollipop, that can help. If those don't help, botulinum toxin injections um, can be tremendously helpful. And those are FDA approved for treating excess saliva or drooling. Yes, absolutely. And thank you. Um, you know, what, what I want to talk about um, is if you can just name some complications of advanced PD that get people into trouble, that can get people into, you know, Smith facilities, nursing homes. What Absolutely. So I think, you know, among the most common things, falls are at the top of the list. Um, and often when folks have advanced PD, they're falling, but they've also unintentionally lost weight. And it's not the kind of weight loss that all of us hope for, it's muscle mass loss. And so if you fall, you're falling and there's less to cushion you. You're falling and there's less to actively catch yourself. You're not strong enough to reach out that arm in front of you and catch yourself. And so you're much more likely when you fall to break something. And that broken hip that leads to the hospitalization and then you stay in the hospital for a while and you might get a pneumonia while in the hospital or a urinary tract infection in the hospital, that's this terrible spiral that leads people downwards. Um, otherwise, urinary tract infections are very common and they don't show up the way we expect them to, which is very frustrating. 
Um, but you know, the brain doesn't change quickly in Parkinson's, but people can have a sudden change in their Parkinson's symptoms. And that should always, always, always make you think about an infection. So if suddenly you're hallucinating when you never were, if you're confused when you never were, if your motor symptoms are suddenly so different on a daily, you know, from one day to the next, it's always that, you know, the case that I tell my patients, I want you to go get your urine checked. If that's not it, you know, do you have symptoms of flu? Do you have symptoms of something else? Because Parkinson's doesn't suddenly drop your symptoms, but something else can. So I think about infections, pneumonia, UTIs, falls, and then agitation or psychosis, hallucinations or delusions that are getting out of control, causing behavioral changes, um, those are all very common. And I think what goes with that, but can be pulled apart separately is caregiver strain. We can't underestimate how much of a burden, you know, it can be for someone to be the person, the sole person responsible for taking care of someone with Parkinson's, depending on what those symptoms are that their loved one has, what that relationship was to begin with and what resources there are to bring to bear, right? If you can throw a ton of money and have 24 seven caregivers, sometimes even that isn't quite enough depending on the situation. But if you know care is really difficult and falls on a single person, um, that, can, that itself can be a reason for people to wind up in a nursing home. Uh, and you know, uh, and this probably is not a question for you because you're really not an insurance agent, but I wonder just because you're involved in this, um, is there long-term care insurance now? And is this something that people can buy? Like, do you get denied if you have a diagnosis of Parkinson's? Like, you know, I've, I'm sorry if this is not the right question for you, but you know, this is something that I always want to know as well. So any insights into that? I would probably defer to the, my social work colleagues. Um, I mean, I think long-term care insurance, do I have folks that have it? Absolutely. And folks that have used it? Yes. I'm not sure in folks who have it and have used it, um, I don't know exactly when they purchased their long-term care insurance. Was it before a diagnosis? Was it early? Was it later in the diagnosis? I think it probably depends on you know, the insurance company itself because that is not subject to the same kind of, we can't refuse you for pre-existing conditions that regular health insurance is, at least as far as I know. Yeah, I think I mean, this is an area that I probably need to do a lot of research as well because I really um, you know, hear, hear this a lot. So in terms of, uh, you know, if you were to tell a Parkinson's patient for them to start thinking about, you know, when would you start thinking about planning for advanced Parkinson's? Like, would you start thinking about when you're diagnosed or would you start thinking about it, you know, when you've had the disease for 10 years? You know, I think it's really individual. Um, my gut, and especially I think COVID has really kind of brought this into light for a lot of people, is that no one wants to talk about advanced care planning and advanced directives and who's going to make decisions if I can't, right? And whether you have Parkinson's or not, that's typically the case. And the problem is it always feels too early to have this discussion until it's too late, right? And so you know, I am guilty of being that one at Thanksgiving that says to my family, we need to talk about this. What decisions have you made? Have you thought about this? Because I want to know, you know, God forbid something happens. I want to know that I'm doing the right thing by my loved one, right? And I want to know, have they thought about this? You know, if so, then, you know, then that. And so I do bring this up with my patients earlier and earlier, um, because so many people haven't thought about these things. And it's really hard to think about, but if you flip the script and think about it as this is a gift to yourself and this is a gift to your family, that you have done some of the hard work of thinking about what's important to you and conveying that to them, it makes things so much easier in the event that you can't speak for yourself, that they have the confidence you know, and they don't feel the guilt of, am I making the wrong decision? Am I doing what mom, dad would have wanted? you've told them to the best that you can, right? So I think, you know, especially if you have the time now and it's COVID and you're, you know, sitting home and locked in and have downtime, um, there are many websites out there that help walk through thinking about advanced planning. Um, it's not just, I filled out a form and I filed it in the cabinet somewhere and I took care of that. Um, 
you know, it should be a conversation. Yeah. So basically ask, asking the, uh, like you said, nobody likes to talk about it, but asking the, the, uh, you know, the, the patient as to what your wishes are certainly goes a long way. Um, and, you know, all of us have been in this situation where somebody's on the ventilator and now you don't know what to do and who's going to make the decision. So I think right. for the audience out there, this is really important. So uh, let's switch gear. Th thanks so much for all this really uh, useful information, Dr. Fleischer. I'm going to switch gears and we're going to talk about what can you tell us? What is palliative care? That's a great question. And I, um, so palliative care, I would argue, if you're seeing a neurologist to take care of your Parkinson's disease, you're getting palliative care because palliative care is symptom focused care that is patient centered, right? So it's what, what is important to you and what is bothering you and let's target that because until we have a cure, everything that we are doing is focused on the symptoms and making your life better. And that's what palliative care is. So many people will go and get training in palliative care as a subspecialty. And if they are primary palliative care folks, they often spend a lot of their time taking care of people with more end stage chronic diseases, frequently cancer, sometimes congestive heart failure, lung diseases, um, but much of neurology is really dealing with, you know, chronic life-changing conditions and symptoms that we cannot make go away entirely, but we can make better. So palliative care may be delivered by a team of specialists. It's not, it shouldn't just be one lone person. It should be, you know, a healthcare provider, whether that's a doctor, a PA, a nurse practitioner, nurses, social workers, chaplains. It takes, takes a lot of people to support a person. Um, and doctors, you know, can't and shouldn't be the only people doing that because there's more to people than just the doctor side of things. Yes, absolutely. And I'm not sure how many physicians, you know, are confused between what palliative care exactly is. Um, you know, I, I, I think like one of the things that, you know, when, when patients start to have problems, I guess, stage four, you know, I always send a referral to palliative care and the patients always feel like, you know, that they're getting towards, you know, am I getting close to the end of my game? And it's hard to explain to them, how do you explain to people that, Palliative care may actually be something good for you, that it may actually provide the kind of care that you need that keeps you comfortable. So I would say five, 10 years ago, the answer to that is exactly what you said, is this is a team of docs that is going to work with me, with your existing team. It's not a handoff. It's not like I'm done with you, now you go to them because I got nothing left to offer. That should never be what palliative care is. Palliative care should be that these are folks who are trained and may have more expertise in challenging and complex symptom management. So as a movement disorders neurologist, I don't have a ton of training in difficult pain management, but my palliative care colleagues do. And I don't have a ton of training in addressing spiritual distress, right, which can take so many different forms, but my palliative care colleagues do. And so it's not a handoff, it's bringing more people in to the mix to support the different symptoms. Um, I don't know if that... Yeah, absolutely. No, absolutely. Um, so, you know, we'll go from palliative care into talking about what is hospice, because a lot of people are, you know, really confused between these two. So what can you yeah. tell us? About absolutely. So I want you to picture a giant circle, right? So palliative care is the giant circle. This applies to anyone, any age, really any stage of a chronic disease where we need to manage symptoms. Okay teeny tiny circle within that broader circle is hospice. So hospice is basically palliative care plus. It's intensified palliative care, it's more support, but it is limited to folks who in the estimation of their treating physician have six months life expectancy or less. Um, I will say that hospice absolutely has so much stigma associated with it and so many people patients, families, and many physicians wrongly feel like hospice is what you do when you've given up and you've got nothing else. Hospice is the last day or two of life. And that is not what hospice is intended for. And that's not where people have the most benefit. Hospice means you have, typically it's, it's in-home hospice. 
So they're sort of hospice in the hospital and hospice at home. Hospice at home is what we think about most of the time when we're thinking about someone with Parkinson's who is coming to the end of their journey with Parkinson's and you know, encountering a lot of those complications. Maybe they're going back and forth to the hospital frequently. They've got a lot of infections. Symptoms are really ramping up. It's becoming very difficult to take care of the person. One way to deal with that is to bring in a nurse to help with that more of the time. They're not, hospice won't provide a nurse 24 seven physically in the home, but it means a nurse who comes and visits on a, a specified basis. Maybe it's once a week, maybe it's twice a week, but the family has a number and that 24 seven, they know that they pick up the phone, they call that number and someone answers. And if the question is, my loved one is you know, doing X, Y, Z much more and it's 3 a.m., what do I do? someone answers that phone and responds to you. And the goal is to keep the person home, if that's their wishes, comfortable and support the patient and the family up to during the time of death and after. And hospice support lasts 13 months after a person passes away, which I think is really surprising to a lot of people, but they are there to help the family get through the grief and the bereavement Absolutely. You know, I learned this through uh, a friend's experience who died of a, a brain tumor and they had little kids and hospice provided music therapy and, you know, a person coming at home, talking with them, for the bereavement support, like you said. So I think it's very, um, it's excellent. Um, my question is, will all insurances pay for hospice? So Medicare covers hospice um, and my understanding is that most private insurances, if not all, are required to cover hospice. It may look a little bit different depending on the agency, but to say hospice, you have to have, you know, nursing, social work, you have to have 24-7 line of care. You have to offer that bereavement support. And often it's, you know, if you need a hospital bed, hospice will get you the hospital bed that you need. If you need supplies, if you need incontinence supplies, if you need other things, hospice will provide that. If pain management is an issue, they'll often provide, you know, sort of, they'll give you your Tylenol if it's kind of, you know, on a scale of one to 10, if it's, you know, one to four, here's some Tylenol, or you can use this, or you can use this, um, you know, really providing kind of a toolkit and education around how and when to use the things in that toolkit. And so, you know, the, the terrible story about hospice is that it's so underused. And so I believe the average length of time that someone spends in hospice is typically around four days. This is a service that's meant to support a person and a family for six months. And what happens if you're still around with six months? Congratulations, mazel tov, we re-up you in hospice if you're still a hospice you know, candidate, um, right? <laughs> it shouldn't be that you, you go into hospice the last day of your life, right? That is, that is sort of the hospice tragedy. And I've seen that on the patient side. I've seen that on the personal side. And I will tell you there is, it's heartbreaking. Um, you know, that, that leaves scars when family finally decides, okay, fine, I'll, you know, I'll break the seal and I'll call in hospice. And it's, it's kind of past the point. And they're there, they wanna help you know, but they, they don't, haven't gotten to know the patient. They haven't gotten to know the family to be able to help as much as they could. Um, and Dr. Chitness, you, you asked the question about, you know, how can hospice be helpful and how, you know, in terms of healthcare providers recognizing this, you know, before we just had to rely on, well, this is what they do. So shouldn't you, you know, accept that that's going to be a good thing? Now there's actually data, right? We had to study this question and a you know, fascinating study that really kicked this off was in lung cancer. And patients were randomized. They signed up. They knew, you know, okay, I'm going to sign up for this clinical study that had stage four metastatic, this will end your life, lung cancer. And they agreed to the study knowing that they would be randomized to either their usual care, they'll keep seeing their oncologist, they'll keep getting chemo or radiation or whatever was going to be done, or they were randomized to hospice with a focus on quality of life and symptom management. And not only did the people getting hospice have better quality of life and better control of their symptoms, they lived longer. They lived longer because you took away all of the side effects and all of the everything from chemo and you let them live their lives. And it turns out people do better. 
And so it was only recently, it was, you know, in February 2020, I think, um, that Dr. Kluger and his colleagues published a fantastic article where they worked with three different centers, three different movement disorder centers across the country, I think one in Canada, um, and people were randomized to either their usual care for Parkinson's or being seen in a sort of Parkinson's plus palliative model. And not surprisingly, people did better, their quality of life was better, their caregiver strain was better in Parkinson's when they were seen with palliative care influenced models, you know, helping to take care of them. So it's not just sort of the common sense of this should work. We now at least have the evidence to say, yeah, and it does. So instead of, you know, being afraid of, of um, palliative care, I think we need to offer it more. And it, it may, it's not just that it helps, uh, you know, patients, uh, pass with dignity in, in their own house. But what you're saying is it might actually buy them more time with their family members than they would have otherwise anticipated, which is right. a good thing as long as they're comfortable, right? Exactly. Oh, thank you. That's a very good point. Uh, what can you tell us about advanced practice and when should people, uh, you know, start thinking about them? Yeah, so I mean, I think we, we hit on this a little bit before, sort of this idea of, you know, it's always too early, no one wants to talk about this. Um, but when, I, when we say advanced directives, I think about this as the who and the what. So if, you know, advanced directive is, if I can't make a decision, a healthcare decision for myself, who do I want speaking for me? Who do I trust? And who have I told enough about what is important to me and what I value in my life in healthcare that it's not just like, oh, my sister's great. You know, I, I trust her to, to do something do I trust her to know what's important to me related to my health, right? So who do you want making that decision? That's your durable healthcare power of attorney. That's a long title to give someone, but um, sometimes we shorthand that as a POA, a power of attorney, but people can have financial power of attorneys. Who do you want to manage your money and your estate and stuff? And who do you want to manage your healthcare? And those don't necessarily have to be the same person. So who is the POA? And then what? So what is important to me? What do I want to happen? What should my healthcare look like? So this can be things like having a living will, which is different than just a will that says, when I'm gone, I want, you know, great aunt Matilda's lamp to go to, you know, my favorite kid. Um, a living will is if I'm unable to speak for myself, do I want, you know, a ventilator? Do I want to be kept alive with a breathing machine? Do I want to be you know, have my chest cracked and pounded, you know, when my heart stops, do I want att all attempts at resuscitation to happen, right? So in a living will, you can spell out different scenarios and say, here's what I want for those. So that's a little bit more descriptive. And then there are things like a do not resuscitate order or a DNR. And a DNR is very specific and really just says, when I die, when my heart stops, which everyone's heart stops at some point, when my heart stops, do I want the teams rushing in, whether that's you know, the EMT and 911, whether this takes place in a hospital, do I want the whole team rushing in and doing everything that they have to try to bring me back? Number one, I think it's important to know that you know, when someone has died, when their heart has stopped, the likelihood of bringing them back, especially if this is, you know, if it happens outside of the hospital, um, the likelihood of bringing someone back and bringing them back to where they were before, resuscitating them, their heart, their brain, to where they before, were before is quite low. Um, but doing everything means, you know, pounding on the chest, means putting a breathing tube in to restore the work of the heart, to try to restore the work of breathing, to get that person alive again. Um, and so... Um, people sometimes, you know, I hear people describe like, I want you to keep me alive. Um, and there's a difference between, you know, keep you alive, of course. And if your heart has stopped, thinking about this as bringing you back, right? And I think those are, that's important to think about. So a DNR really just has to do with bringing you back. Um, and so that's a very specific thing. Another sort of example of one of these documents is something called a MOLST or PULST, which is um, a medical order or physician order for life-sustaining treatment. And that is a document that you talk through your wishes with your family, with your healthcare provider, and you sign off and say, you know, 
DNR or not DNR and this or this, and you've signed it, the healthcare provider has signed it, and then you take that home and you keep that on your fridge, not in a drawer, not in the safe. You keep it on the fridge so that if something happens and 911 is called or you know a caregiver is, is there and taking care of you, they know what you want, it's right there in their face, and that form travels with the person to the emergency room, to the hospital. Because for example, you know, if I see patients and they've completed some of that paperwork and I've scanned it into my system, but they live far out in Indiana and they go to their local community hospital, that community hospital doesn't know their wishes. So having something that goes with you is really important. Absolutely. And uh, in interest of time, I just want you to um, tell us, you know, what, uh, what kind of resources, like how do you look, you know, uh, online, there's so much information and we know that not everything is legitimate. So what, what sources do you as a, a provider, as a physician look for, uh, you know, and that you could tell the patients that, that they can look for? Um, and I think there are, there are a lot of really good ones out there. Um, so I like, there's something called the conversation project, which just starts with the premise that this isn't just a form. It is talk with your family, talk with yourself about what's important. So I think it's the conversation project.org. Um, it's on the slides. I'm happy to share out the slides. Um, there is something called plan your lifespan. And that's also really good. I think that's also a .org. Um, that talks through a little bit broader even than healthcare, but that talks through some of the, you know, will and financial power of attorney and things like that. Um, so those are two good ones. I like fivewishes.org, but I think that that one may come with some fee. Um, but it also kind of talks through what's most important to you. Is it more important to be entirely comfortable and in no pain or to be, you know, entirely awake, you know, and, and with it? To the very end or are you more somewhere in the middle so that one kind of gets into a little bit more nitty-gritty um, of certain things i think a lot of these are helpful to kind of look at the different websites and and see which feels better to your personality it's your best absolutely and so dr fleischer are you okay with sharing your slides with the yes absolutely slides? okay and you know so uh, i want i want to leave some time for questions uh, thank you again for explaining this very complex information i want to also say you know, when I was in medical school, I don't remember ever being taught about palliative care. Of course, and perhaps does not, uh, you know, it's a very new concept in India where I grew up, certainly, a, you know, pretty uh, advanced and well-developed discipline here. But as you clearly said, underutilized. So I think it's also important, you know, that we educate all members of the team. It's also important that we educate the patients and the family members like we are doing now and in multiple forums so that they themselves feel empowered to ask about it. If, if your physician didn't mention it, you know, I mean, if everybody like you, you have, you have this thing on your slide, which says it takes a team, right? So it's, you basically have your uh, patient, the care partners, friends and family, the movement disorder guy, the family physician, the PT, OT, social worker, psychologist, and, you know, palliative care in various forms. And so, if everybody is speaking the same language, somebody would pick and say, hey, I think this patient needs to go to palliative care. And that's what we're trying to do, you know, with, with our group here is we are trying to recognize, you know, um, when's a good time to start that conversation. So thank you yeah. really very much. Uh, if you have any final uh, comments on that, uh, and I'm going to uh, start looking at the questions people are sending. Yeah, I was going to say it's, you know, it's almost similar to sexual dysfunction and Parkinson's is the healthcare provider might think, well, this could be going on. They might want to talk about this, but how do I bring this up? It's kind of awkward. I didn't get trained in med school to, to ask if the person is having erectile dysfunction. The doctor may also have never been trained to ask about palliative care and to really, you know, they may not get how different palliative care is versus the narrow focus of hospice. And they may be worried that if they say, you know, do you want to talk about goals of care? What's most important to you that the patient might, you know, step back, the patient might not like them, the patient might think that they're saying it's the end when that's not the case. Um, there's a lot of stigma around this from all sides. So I, you know, I commend all of you on the call just for logging into a call about palliative care, you know, and hopefully you recognize it's not a dirty word. It's not, you know, your doctor is not 
giving up on you. Your doctor is not saying it's the end. Um, that's not what this is. This is us trying to bring more people to bear to, to help improve quality of life. No, absolutely. Can I flash you one last question? There's only a couple of questions, so I think I can ask you one more question. Some of the patients, uh, you know, when the patient starts to choke or aspirate or get a UTI, you know, people will sometimes want to break hospice, you know, because people get scared. I mean, as much as you <laughs> think you've signed up to hospice, recognizing that your family member may have six months uh, or less to live, but when that actually moment or the you know, the, the, the concern for that moment comes, you know, that people want to break hospice. What are your thoughts on that? You know, I think, um, I think those are conversations to try to have in advance, um, to think about, and, and usually like a good hospice nurse will sort of talk through, okay, let's, let's imagine that, you know, it's 2 a.m. and X, Y, Z is happening, you know, in the moment, you're gonna to wanna to call 911 or you might you know, wanna do the following. Here are the options on the table, right? And so I think just knowing, you know, sometimes it's, something happens and it's so scary and the only thing we know to do is to call 911 or to go to the emergency room, um, you know, and, and that's okay. Um, but if the goal is I wanna be comfortable at home, you know, then and when you when you kind of start that process of you know calling nine one one going to the hospital being in the ER, you're kind of putting yourself almost on the the walk later at the airport right. You're kind of on that path and it's it's hard um, to get off that path right once once that's started. So um, it's not impossible. But yes, is it possible to break hospice? Absolutely. Um, you know I think the one hard and fast thing that's often a really big sticking point, and I completely understand why. And this is something that I have a lot of patients that. We've talked about hospice, but they're not ready yet because your meds should continue as long as they're symptomatic and they're treating you know, something and they're helping your quality of life. And I will argue tooth and nail for just about every one of my Parkinson's patients, all of their meds helping their quality of life. Um, the hospice won't cover physical therapy, speech therapy, occupational therapy, because those are seen as curative, mm -hmm. even though we would all disagree um, in this case, right? Those are seen as curative, and so hospice won't cover curative treatments. Um, so you didn't hear it from me, but if you, for example, have, you know, if you are, you or your loved one is going into hospice, but it is really important to you and you feel like you benefit, especially from a particular therapist, you know, I have had families where they may pay out of pocket and they kind of keep it on the DL, um, you know, or they have a physical therapy student. Um, you know, who comes and visits them and gives them exercises and they keep up those exercises um, as they are entering hospice, right? So it's a little bit of a workaround, eh, but, um, you know, but, but you have to do what's important and what, what helps you feel good. You know, um, I, I'm not ashamed to say I'm right there with you because, you know, um, I think there's rules and there's rules, but, you know, I mean, I, I think that as long as I'm not doing anything illegal and it is for my patient, you know, that's, that's what I care about, right? I always try to put myself in the position of my patient or their family member. And so you're right. I mean, there are people that will pay, you know, uh, cash to, to get some of those services. Right. And I mean, you know, and that's a privilege and, and certainly not everyone has the resources to do, to do that. But have I argued and screamed at hospice people and Medicare people to say, my patient has stiffness and pain and physical therapy is working with them and increasing range of motion and that is improving quality of life. And they go, yes, but the protocol says we do not allow physical therapy. So great, you don't allow physical therapy? We'll come from a different angle, right? <laughs> That's palliative care. <laughs> Absolutely. So I'm gonna go uh, you know, on to asking um, uh, some questions here. My, my one question is, uh, how do you ensure that there is a good communication between the family care doctor or the movement disorder neurologist and the hospice people? If they have a question, like, you know, because a lot of times there are questions and, and they may not know all the answers, but we may know the answers. Is there a way to ensure that we're in good communication with hospice people? Because to me, you know, the care of my patients it continues until the day they die. 
So um, I, my team calls me mama bear almost every day because I don't let go of my people unless you tell me that you want me to let go of you. Ooh. Right. And so right behind you, I am usually the one. And, you know, for most of our, for many people, they may have not seen their primary care or their family care doc in a long time. And often like we become their, their primary care person, right? Which for better or worse, sometimes that happens. And so I'm usually the one putting in the order, putting in the referral to hospice and I call it in, I put it, I do it electronically, I send it, but then I call and I speak with a hospice intake person and I say, I will be the attending physician of record. If antibiotics are needed or something that is outside of my scope of practice, then I'm gonna lean on your team and you know, let you handle that. But the rest of it, you go through me. And- Absolutely. That, that's, you know, I think we, um, once you become a movement disorder doctor and a Parkinson specialist, I think there's a reason why we all gravitate together because we share the kind of the same philosophy, you know, and all of my friends with an MDS would say the same. Okay, so how do I know if I'm a candidate for palliative care? I think you kind of answered that, but you know, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, if you're asking as a patient, am I a candidate for palliative care? I would think about what symptoms are most bothersome to you? And, you know, do you want to talk with someone, even if it's not symptoms? Is it, how do I know what my goals of care are? And I don't really even know how to start thinking about that. That's a reason to see palliative care. Um, you know, a palliative care specialist can have that conversation to really try to suss out with you and kind of walk through that conversation of, let's imagine this happens, you know, what would you want in that case? And, and what about if this happens? Okay. Well, what I hear from you is that this is important to you and this is important to you. And if that's the case, then let's put the following down on paper and here's how we do that, right? And that, that is an incredibly valuable, you know, hour, hour and a half spent with a doctor. Um, people, what I, I heard a great um, analogy sometime, which is that, you know, every specialty has a procedure, right? Surgeons have their surgery that they do and OBGYN has deliveries and, you know, everyone has a procedure. Palliative care doctors, their procedure is conversation. They, they train yeah. and they are amazing at having these difficult conversations. Um, you know, I think the other thing is if there are symptoms that you feel like are not being adequately managed, pain, psychiatric symptoms, urinary things, um, you know, then getting palliative care looped in can also be really helpful. Thank you. Um, if I'm disabled, I wanna be considered for hospice and self-administered morphine, is that possible? to direct a slow death, so to speak? Um, I think that's a difficult question. So while there are some um, places where there's, you know, there are options for end of life and sort of physician assisted um, end of life, right? That is few and far between. Um, and so can you have a morphine pump it probably depends on condition and the attending physicians and the hospice and all of that kind of stuff. I think that is not something that's typically done. If someone is in such intractable pain um, that, you know, they need to be on a pain pump like that to be able to say, okay, you know, I, I need more. I'm, I'm so uncomfortable. Um, if you have the cognitive ability to be able to control that, often that's someone who is in an inpatient hospice. Um, but at home hospice, can people have something like that? You often have sort of, here's your morphine regimen that you can take. And for breakthrough pain, you know, here's the extra step. Um, often there are, you know, certain limits on that. Um, but I think that that kind of is an individual situation. And also I think it depends on the state where you live. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Very good. Uh, let's see. Somebody wants to know how to manage REM sleep behavioral disorder symptoms when clonazepam is a fall of risk and melatonin 15 milligrams is only partially effective. Good question. Um, so there was a great talk at a, at a recent MDS conference um, and the, the world guru in REM behavior, to sleep, REM behavior disorder said, the treatment of REM behavior disorder is bed on floor because the patient does not tend to be as bothered by it unless they're falling out of their bed or they're cracking their head on the sharp nightstand or the vase that's inevitably there, right? Or they're whacking their partner. Um, 
it's glib and that's obnoxious. And most people with Parkinson's are not going to do well with a bed on the floor. But I think there's, there's something to that, which is, can you change the, the sleeping environment? If it's that, you know, the REM behavior disorder is awakening your partner um, and then they're smacking you and saying, you know, you're screaming again, right? Maybe that, that does mean sleeping in separate spaces. Um, still trying to maintain intimacy in other ways, which is a whole other topic, right? But um, it means covering those sharp corners of the nightstand so that if you flail, you don't hit yourself or knock over your glasses. Um, it means maybe putting a yoga mat under the lip of the bed so that if you fall out, there's something there. Um, a trick that I love, which is cheap, is to get, especially now that it's the summer, do this before they're on clearance, um, is to get cheap styrofoam pool noodles. Line them longitudinally along the edges of your bed and stretch your sheets over them. You give yourself a little bit of a lip so that if you flail, there's a little bit of something, there's an edge to the bed to catch you before you fall out, right? Um, so those are things that are helpful. You know, and I think if melatonin is not helpful, um, clonazepam, while it is a fall risk, right? Clonazepam at small doses, depending on the patient, can be very helpful. Because if you're sleeping through the night, if you're not waking up with a REM behavior disorder, you know, there's sort of the, the fall risk of untreated REM behavior disorder um, and the fall risk of the medications. And so we have to balance that out really carefully. Yeah, and sometimes maybe, I mean, you know, sometimes people are on medications like dopamine agonists that you could take them off and, and use it for some other things. Yeah. Guess, right? um, so last question is, since, since PD affects different people in personal ways, is it not a better investment to save an annual budget for care at home? Huh. I think that's a, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think... Yes, is the short answer. I think that, you know, having, having that rainy day fund, um, you know, is a great idea. If that's, you know, within someone's capacity to put away that money, whether that's, you know, long-term care insurance, which is what that, that you know, should be. Um, and many plans allow you to use that either for an assisted living or a nursing home or care and at home, which is almost always going to be less expensive. Um, even though the price tag is still staggering, right? So if you are able to plan for that, you know, most people when asked, Parkinson's or otherwise, most people ask, you know, given the choice of dying at home, dying in a hospital, dying in a nursing home, most people say, I, I want to die at home. I want to be comfortable. I want to be surrounded by the people and the things and the places that are meaningful to me. And so anticipating that and thinking about that is really helpful. I think the other place, you know, to think about putting that money is not just, you know, sitting, sitting in the account for when I need someone to come in and help, but what are the things, walk around your home, there are great like fall prevention and home safety checklists that are available online. Walk around your home and think about the places where you almost fall if you're not falling. The places that you catch yourself and you have to catch onto the wall, right? Fix those now. Fix those before you fall before you wind up in the hospital, before you need a home person coming to help you to recover from your fall, right? It's almost, it's going through with like the Sherlock Holmes mind and saying, wait, wait, I love this throw rug. It is, you know, Aunt Martha's treasured throw rug. Maybe I pick it up off the floor because it scoots all the time or it flops over and I catch my foot on it and I turn it into a tapestry, right? Great, still stays there, but you don't have to fall on it. Um, you know, it's putting in the grab bars, even if they're ugly, because what's uglier is the gash in the wall or the grab bars in the nursing home, right? And um, I think changing your environment to suit you and anticipating some of those changes, you know, really saves money in the end and improves quality of life in the end. Um, to be in your home, you know, that you have changed on your own terms rather than having someone else come in and change it for you. Yeah, very good. And my last question is, Dr. Fleischer, have you ever, you know, when, when people are in, in hospice, is there a time come when you decide that you're going to stop all Parkinson's medications? My biggest concern is if they would go into, you know, a neuroleptic malignant syndrome. Uh, yeah. have, you, have you ever stopped medication entirely or just reduce it to where it is, you know, um, perhaps helping symptoms a little bit, but not causing side effects? 
Exactly. I, in people with PD, I cannot think of a person with Parkinson's where I've completely stopped the medication. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't. And, and again, because of the risk of withdrawal and, and side effects from that, but also there's usually some benefit. And often the only way we know that the meds are still giving some benefit is when you take them away and suddenly something gets worse. Right. And often in these end stages of Parkinson's, if you take the meds away and something suddenly gets worse and we put the meds back, sometimes we don't go right back to that baseline. It's, and I cannot explain it. I don't think anyone can explain why, but it's almost like you just dropped the baseline and you can't get right back there. And so if it's not causing problems, I leave it alone. On the flip side, if someone has one of the atypical Parkinsonisms, PSP or something like that, often I will get those away because they just, they may get to a point where there is no clear benefit and there, there are side effects. Absolutely. And with that, I think we're at time or a little bit over. And um, I'll have Shelly have some final comments. But Dr. Fleischer, thank you so much. This was delightful and, and very, very helpful for everybody. Thank you so much, Dr. Fleischer, for that excellent information. And thank you for being willing to share your slides with us. I know that those in the call would definitely appreciate that. I hope everyone enjoyed tonight's webinar. We tried to answer as many questions as we could. If there's anything else you need or additional ways in which we can serve you, please send us an email at info at skypassfoundation.org. That's all we have for tonight. Thanks, everyone. We look forward to seeing you again soon. Good night.